So thank you all so much for being here this evening. My name, for those of you that I have not met yet, is Josh Hiscock. I'm the Associate Vice President for Alumni Relations at BCU. And I'm very, very excited to be with all of you tonight for this special event uh, here in San Francisco, uh, here in Los Altos. I'm really thrilled for many reasons. One is that BCU uh, is very committed to its alumni. We are here for an event that's part of uh, what we're calling the Elevate Tour. Elevate is our new strategic plan for alumni engagement at VCU. Uh, for many, many years, you had to pay to be a member of our alumni association. And if you didn't pay to be a member, you really didn't get contacted. You weren't very engaged. Uh, we only had 13,000 paid members of our alumni association, but we had 193,000 alumni. So proportionally, you can see where the problem is, right? Most of our alumni, we're not paying to be members, we're not hearing from the university, and, and so our alumni leaders from our alumni association board and the staff of our office of alumni relations said, what if we change the membership model? They get free for everybody to be a member and really just engage people, create a new plan for how to do that. And that's where the Elevate strategic plan came from. Elevate. Uh, is an acronym, Expanding Leadership, Enrichment, and Volunteerism for Alumni Through Engagement. It's kind of a mouthful, that's why we just call it Elevate, right? That's what acronyms are meant for. So Elevate is a new strategic plan that says, you know what, let's do social events for alumni, but also lifelong learning opportunities to connect to research, research, arts, culture, faculty. Let's do professional industry networking like this where we bring people together, not necessarily on the degree they received, but on the industry in which they work, or the industry in which they're interested. Because all too often, you know, somebody gets an English degree, but very few people work in English, right? They deploy their English degree in some other field or profession, and we want to make sure people are connected in, in ways that are relevant. Because our goal as a university is to engage 25% of our alumni every year in some way. So right now, that would be about 50,000 unique alumni. We want you to open our emails, come to events, volunteer your time with the university, perhaps as a mentor, either in person or online. We'd love for you to be a part of our chapter here in San Francisco, in the greater San Francisco area, to really help keep programming going, or perhaps to make a gift to the university, to student scholarships, or something that might move you that you're passionate about. Just being involved in some way is important to VCU. Uh, Jay Davenport, my boss, who's our Vice President for Development and Alumni Relations, and Dr. Michael Rao, our University President, are both very committed to alumni. They've increased my staff from a team of 5 to 15. They've given us a lot more programming money to work with to be able to be creative in delivering more programming, not just in Richmond, but around the country, which is why we're rolling out the Elevate Strategic Plan with a 23-city international tour. We'll do 22 domestic cities and we'll travel to our VCU campus in Doha, Qatar uh, in February to share more about our strategic plan with alumni. And uh, rather than just talk about it, be about it. That's why since we've been here in San Francisco, we've done a basketball watch party, a recent graduate networking night. We're here with you today uh, for an industry panel about the uh, you know, agents of innovation. And we've also done a breakfast with our president and a number of alumni this morning down in Fisherman's Wharf. It's, an explosion of opportunity for alumni, and we're excited to talk to you about that. Um, but enough from me. I want to turn you, uh, it over to our moderator for this evening's panel. And I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the evening for anybody that wants to learn more about what we're doing. We are live on both Facebook Live and Instagram Live uh, across the country and across the world. No pressure. <laughs> They're like, I thought I was talking to a crowd in a room. Uh, the room is a little bit larger, but the reality is we want to do more of this. If, if you are not in a place at a certain time, you shouldn't miss out on great programming. You're going to hear amazing things tonight from our panelists, really insightful thoughts, things that might draw a question you want to ask that somebody across the country might want to know the answer to. So we're thankful for all of those people tuning in tonight on Facebook and Instagram, you have the chance to ask questions. We'll be monitoring both accounts, and so feel free to ask, uh, type your question in, and we'll circle back to you when, when we can to get those answered. And just know that when we leave to head to Los Angeles tomorrow, on Thursday, we have a panel with a number of arts entertainment grads, and we're gonna be live streaming that as well. 
So that'll be on Thursday night at 6.30 Pacific, 9.30 Eastern time. And so that'll be a fantastic panel as well. So lots of great content from the West Coast. Good things happen here, right? So we're excited. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce our moderator for this evening's discussion, uh, Jeff Beck, who is the CEO and co-founder of Answers Now. A licensed clinician and entrepreneur, Jeff is passionate about helping families work through their unique challenges. For a while, he served uh, as a family therapist, and he recognized that, that parents of children with special needs were lacking immediate, personalized, reliable help. And he saw that need and wanted to act upon it. Um, Answers Now grew from that. It's a platform that simplifies on-demand support for caregivers of children. Um, prior to Answers Now, uh, Jeff had done a number of things. I'm just gonna read these so I don't get them wrong. He worked for Virginia Care Partners, which was a subsidiary of HCA, uh, a major health administration corporation. He was the director of community-based services at St. Joseph's Villa. He has a master's of social work from VCU, so a, an alum just like all of you in the room tonight. Uh, he lives in Richmond, Virginia, uh, with his wife Amy, who is a part of our alumni relations staff, and uh, a future alumna herself, um, and their five-month-old son, Sonny, uh, who has made the trip to California as well. Um, he's visited at least three states this week, so he's doing very, very well. Uh, we're very excited um, that Sonny is with us on the trip as well. Um, VCU cares about families, cares about alumni, and I think Jeff is a great example of an alumnus who's helping to put all those things together. So please um, give a round of applause for our moderator for the evening, uh, Jeff Beck. Thank you, everybody. All right, so it's my job to make sure I introduce these three incredible people, uh, and I'm going to read from my phone because I have not memorized their bios. So we've got Vern in the middle. Vern is originally from Rochester, New York. Um, Vernon uh, is a 2012 graduate from the School of Business with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Information Systems. Prior to his accomplishments of graduating at VCU, Vernon graduated from high school at the age of 16. During Vernon's studies as a student, he would be recruited by Capital One to join the financial company at its McLean, Virginia-based uh, headquarters. His first, first position would be in the technology development program as a quality automation engineer. This is where Vern developed the C1 mobile banking application. After being at Capital One for a year, Vern, Vern shifted career tracks and focused on application security, where he self-taught himself how to trade stocks through a vigorous reading program. The shift from security to financial tech would eventually lead Byrne to being placed in Capital One's Capital Markets Division, where he supported derivative trading and helped with university recruiting efforts. Currently, Byrne is the CEO and co-founder of Halo. Halo is a tech startup building a solution to help early stage job seekers find actionable information about companies in the job search process. Halo is an Expo Labs company currently based out of Silicon Valley and working directly with the co-founder of Uber, Garrett Camp, as well as Human Radford, founder of Advis, to build the platform. Melissa Nearly, although in the end, she's a software engineer at Apple. She works on the device management team, whose mission is to ensure Apple devices can be used seamlessly in group or distributed settings, such as classrooms, hospitals, or businesses. Melissa graduated from VCU in 2016 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science. In 2014, she became the first VCU student to earn an internship at BMW. She spent two years in a co-op on the mobility solutions team at BMW in Greenville, South Carolina probably not quite as cool as Silicon Valley, <laughs> where she learned the craft of iOS app development. She credited this opportunity for not only teaching her skill, but for introducing her to lifelong mentors and friends in the iOS community. She began working at Apple in 2017 and has enjoyed the, swip, the switch from building iOS apps to building iOS itself, along with watch OS, tvOS, and macOS. In her free time, she loves to gallivant around San Francisco, keep in touch with fella, fellow Theta Tau Kappa Gamma alumni, crush your siblings in Mario Kart. Is that N64 or is that the new? Oh uh, no, it's Switch. Okay. Switch. Yeah. Yeah. The, new, the new upgraded version. Yeah. Engage in deep, meaningful conversations with her cat, Gus, and watch VC basketball games. And Alan Calderwood, Alan graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering, as well as a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics at VCU in 2015. Prior to the start of his career with Google, Alan worked part-time for a few startups in the Bay Area. Alan began working at Google on the Android platform and the Pixel experience. He has recently moved teams in, internally and is now working on Android TV, 
primarily focusing on the server side and less client work. In his free time, Alan enjoys hanging out with friends, playing games, and working on side projects. Welcome, my So the first question I'd like for all of you to answer, so if, uh, we can just kind of go down the go down the line. The mics are off. I'm not gonna use. Can you guys hear me? If I do not use the mic, if you guys want them, they're back here. If you don't, feel not. Feel free. So I want to hear a little bit about your first experience, each of you, with technology. So when did you know you wanted to work in tech? What was the first computer you worked on? Um, just tell me a little bit about the first time you got really excited about technology. Sort of so. Uh... <laughs> Probably the first time I got excited with tech was back in middle school. Uh, I used to play RuneScape, which maybe a lot of people have, but uh, uh, they used to have these like uh, scripting, scripting bots and things for like cheating in the game. <laughs> uh, so uh, those were interesting. You could program them and configure them and such, and, and that kind of like led to me taking programming classes in high school. And, and and actually, you know, oddly enough, when I went to college, I, I was only a math major, I didn't actually go into computer science directly, um, but I was hitting like the end of my sophomore, beginning of my junior year, and I was like, oh, I, like, I need a minor to graduate, like, well, I've always done programming, I'll minor in computer science, and then I remember my first computer science class, I, uh, like, I had an amazing TA, who was a great mentor to me, and he helped me learn a lot, he helped, like, teach me everything, like, so much, and really, like, pushed me to be, like, really great, and that was really what pushed me to kind of like be like, oh my gosh, I need to like, get a career in this. I need to go really far here because I love it and it was, it was like a lot of fun. So. Do you remember the? Can we get a shout out to the TA? Do you remember their names? <laughs> it's actually right there. In the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, David Jackson is best friend. We hang out every so often. That's awesome. <laughs> we actually moved out here at the same time. Oh really? Right. He graduated with a PhD though. <laughs> yeah, we were roommates for like like two years. Yeah, yeah, we we made that long. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, yes. uh, yeah. Burn, same question. Like, what, when, when did you get excited about technology? Uh, Remember the first computer you were on? I'd just love to hear a little bit about your path. Yeah. So both of my parents worked in technology. So my mom, um, she graduated in marketing, but she started her career at Xerox. So I'm from Rochester, New York. Xerox Park, as we know, they did a lot of great stuff. Um, she started her career there. So I was, you know, she, we had computers in our house and that kind of thing. Um, but my dad also started his career at EDS. My dad graduated as a mathematician. Um, he started his career at EDS as a COBOL programmer. So I saw both of my parents. So that's how I skipped a grade and graduated 16, because I was really good in math. Um, so my dad was really good in math. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've always seen computers and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, but basically my parents were super into technology early on. Awesome. Yeah, um, coincidentally, similarly to both of um, these guys here, I, my um, path to technology really actually rooted in math. My like love for math and my um, kind of excel, um, excel in that field. And I, it was kind of a domino effect really that led me. I started off in high school working as a math instructor um, at this place called Mathnasium and I really loved it. And I remember like I was the only high school student that they had at that time. So they would ask me like, oh, what do you wanna, where are you gonna go for college? What do you wanna study? And I was like, I have no idea. And I remember one day I finally, I, I think I was having like a really good day at work. I was like, I just love math. I wanna do math all, all the time. <laughs> and um, one of my coworkers who was actually in Georgia Tech School of Engineering was like, if you love math all the time, you should study computer science. And I was like, okay. And then I did um, and it worked out. And um, if it hadn't really been suggested for me, to me, I don't know. Um, I knew, I already knew I wanted to go um, into engineering, but I hadn't really ever considered computer science before then. Um, so that's really what pushed me. And then, you know, growing up, I was excited about technology. I think our generation, along with uh, maybe the generation older than us as well, we were kind of the first generation to really be like better than our parents at computers. <laughs> and that was always like an exciting thing for me because, you know, my parents would try to like put rules and restrictions and like on time limits, but like I could always get around them and that sort of thing. But that was never in my mind like, oh, I'm good at this. It was just like, oh, like I'm just sneaky. So um, <laughs> so I remember being really excited about that. I was always on the computer messaging my friends on AIM and that sort of stuff, but that was never really a connection until I was suggested computer science and then I went, I went for it. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, all three of the roles that you said, you know, Google, 
Silicon Valley startup working next to the co-founder of Uber, Apple, all of your roles have been captured by pop culture, entertainment, TV shows, movies. Uh, walk us through what a day in the life looks like. Do you take a floating car to work? Do you, yes. do you pass Steve Jobs murals? Like, what? Tell us what a day in the life, what the office is like, what your five-star free meals are like, uh, <laughs> your 25-hour work days where you're trying to yeah. get the startup off the ground. Just each of you, I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, walk us through a day in the life. Sure, sure. So for me, like, uh, I, I, most days are, are pretty good. Um, <laughs> not, um, uh, I usually roll into work at like 11 a.m. And that's like, honestly, pretty normal. I think maybe it's a little late, but uh, <laughs> but it's, it's not like that abnormal in the Bay Area. Because uh, ultimately, it's all about like hitting, hitting deadlines or like meeting expectations. And I've been doing it for three years and haven't said anything, so. <laughs> Um, so roll in, uh, answer a few emails, etc. cetera, uh, go to lunch, there's like 10, 20 cafes or something, or just like free lunch, you pretty much anything you want, it's, you can get, it's, it's, that's probably my favorite perk, <laughs> next to coming in late, and then, uh, then usually just kind of programming for like the day, uh, maybe like one meeting, dinner at 6.30, maybe program a little more, depending on if I have some pass and drive to uh, finish up. So typically dinner on campus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I haven't used my kitchen in <laughs> years. <laughs> nice, nice perk. Question perk. Uh, yeah. It's, it's super busy. I, I'd say that I guess I'll start. The best part about, I guess, my office, you mentioned like Garrett and all these guys are in the office. Uh, that's, that's really, I mean, it's interesting to see someone like that who's built, I mean, he built StumbleUpon, sold to uh, eBay, bought it back. He's built Uber, it's huge, right? Um, super nice guy, super smart. Um, so our office is not that big. He gave us office space in San Francisco on mission. Uh, if you guys are downtown or you email me, you can come by, it's, it's super cool. Um, but the office is pretty lively. Um, he's in there, he built Uber. Um, this guy, Vitor, he built Twitter. He's the first designer at Twitter at 19. Uh, you remember Foursquare and Naveen is a partner. Uh, he built Foursquare, and then Hooman who built Add This and sold it to Oracle. All those guys are floating around the office. You can basically get time with them whenever you want. But um, my day is pretty intense. I wake up at like 5 a.m., go to the gym. It's like the gym is like a daily part of my life because I'm so, it's, my days are so intense that I have to have something to like cool off. Um, I play lacrosse, so I think I'm gonna like join a lacrosse league here in San Francisco soon. But it's basically like gym, 5 a.m., get the Orange Theory, burn a ton of calories, <laughs> go to work, and I try to get ahead of the emails on the East Coast. Um, we built our platform and we didn't know how fast it was gonna scale. Uh, we started off with maybe like 12 schools on our platform and now there's a 143 universities on there. So I'm managing all those relationships. Um, so I have to get ahead of the kind of like the prime time hour on the East Coast to talk to students, talk to candidates, talk to like schools. Um, usually don't take lunch at all. Uh, I manage a lot of the product stuff on our team. So my co-founder, he runs a lot of the tech. Uh, so I usually meet with these guys pretty frequently to see what's going on. Uh, I told them these guys that we're launching a, a new uh, version of our product next, or on this Sunday, actually. So we're doing migrations for that now, and it's like super intense. And we're supposed to go to Japan in like two weeks too. So we don't even know how to do that. Fundraising, it's like, really intense, you're always like managing relationships because you wanna have these soft introductions to people so that when it's time to raise, you're not like, hey, give me $10 million. You're like, hey, remember me? I told you what I was gonna do here. Give me $10 million, right? Um, but yeah, we usually don't end our days until maybe seven or eight, but when I get home, I mean, I'm always on my phone. This is like a thing, I go out with my mom, she's probably like watching this, but every time I go out with anyone, I'm always on my phone, like all the time. So yeah, it's, it's like a 24 hour job. But we don't we don't get free food. <laughs> we get uh, Uber Eats. But our office is super nice. We're spoiled in that sense that we have a really good staff at our office that kind of like give us they give us like a lot of parties and free kind of food sometimes. So not a lot of work like that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, mine is a little bit more aligned with Alan working at a big company. <laughs> um, although I will say, and I hope they don't matter if we're saying this, but at Apple there's no free food. <laughs> so. Just some of the squash you're subsidized. Subsidized. It's subsidized. It's subsidized, but you're still, it's not free. So <laughs> let me just squash your dreams right there, but um, in my own. But yeah, so 
Um, very similar, our, our team, at Apple, everything I, you know, what I say is really gonna be my experience for my team. Every, all teams at Apple are different. All teams really have the autonomy to make their own rules, their own schedules based on how best they operate. Um, so my experience is really uh, personal to my team. But we have like core hours between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m., which is when you're pretty much expected to be there. And then people can either come in earlier than that uh, or later than that to, you know, with whatever their schedule is for the up remaining hours. Um, I usually come in later. I live, I live in the city. I commute to, down to Cupertino, so I come in later and I stay late to, so I miss those peak uh, traffic hours. Um, and yeah, my day to day, um, we, I, I work in the new Apple building. If you guys have seen it, it's like circular. Um, it's like a ring shape and that's really cool. We moved in around last year at this time. Um, it's really nice. It, it kind of almost feels like working in an art museum or something. Like it reminds me a lot actually of the BMFA back in Richmond, but every, all the walls are like almost like they look like white marble. They're like white, um, but it's really cool. And they plant, they've done an amazing job with the landscaping. There's like flowers and different types of trees everywhere. And then you can look past down to the foothills with like the mountains. And so it's, it's really beautiful um, building space. And then I program uh, for a lot of my day, but also depending on where in the development cycle we are, there'll be a lot of meetings, whether it's like planning meetings, future meetings, like HI meetings um, to go over things and then, um, as well as like meetings with QA, so I can like explain to them a new feature and I can tell them the best way that they should be testing a feature that I've built. Um, so yeah, I would say depending on my, depending on where we are in our development cycle, my day can be anywhere from like 30, like probably like anywhere from 10% meetings to like 40% meetings, depending on um, where we are. But, um, but yeah, I guess that's, a, I usually do eat lunch and dinner at the office, um, just because I, I like to work, so it's hard to pry me away from my keyboard. But um, if I have plans in the city, of course, I, I'll leave early, and um, no one is you know keeping me there for any time, so um, I'll leave early and like make it back to the city for plans in the evening if I have any. Um, but yeah, I guess that's like pretty much sums up my day. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Bernard, I don't want to tell you like how to run your company, but I think a Google or Apple acquisition <laughs> sounds pretty sweet. Yeah. I would actually cry right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to hear, you know, we're here with a bunch of alums, VCU alums out here in San Francisco. I'd love to hear why did each of you choose VCU and how did it prepare you for this um, cush, more crazy lifestyle that, that you guys all live and, and the work that you do. Uh, so yeah, when I, well basically, <laughs> when I graduated high school, I had no plans of going to college at all, actually. Um, I literally left high school and told my mom, I was like, oh, I'm just going to like help you out. I'm from like a single parent home. I told my mom, like, I'm going to just go get a job and help you out. So I actually went to work at UPS, which is interesting. I just worked at UPS like loading trucks. Um, one day, this guy, like my manager at UPS was like, like I was loading the trucks basically not efficiently, but trying to get it done faster. I would like build a wall and just throw all the boxes behind. So if your package was like damaged with me, so but, uh, he was like, "Burn, you shouldn't do that." Like you, you know, I told you not to do that. You're never gonna do anything with your life but work here for me. Uh, I quit that day, and my dad was living in Richmond, Virginia. I called him. He was working at Capital. I called him like, "Yeah, I need to go to school." Like, but I don't even know the process. I have no idea what I'm doing. He was like, "Yeah, you can try to go to VCU." came down, checked out VCU, like he literally came to get me like that weekend. I went to VCU and I met Miss Day, Marilyn Day, she's in the career center, I believe. So shout out to Miss Day, she actually got me into school. So I got there and they were like, hey, your grades, like your test scores like are great and you're super smart, but like you're not gonna get into VCU. So I was like, okay. She was, Miss Day was actually like, you can actually matriculate in. So I was able to take, I had to pay out of pocket, take three classes a semester, I paid out of pocket and I worked on the side as a math tutor. I'm at Elkhart Middle School. So I could only take three classes per semester. I had to get a 4.0 GPA and then I could matriculate in. So Ms. Day put me in like whatever, advanced Java, like discrete mathematics, a couple classes. And I had to get a 4.0 and then I matriculated into VCU uh, and did all the college stuff. And yeah, that's pretty much how I got into school actually. So it's been like a grind. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I visited VCU when I was like a senior in 
high school, and um, I was mostly looking in state. I, so I'm from Virginia as well, and so um, I was mostly looking in state at uh, schools in Virginia, and um, I went to the open house for the School of Engineering, and you know there was like a breakout <coughs> session for like all the different disciplines within the School of Engineering. And that event really I solidified it for me. I really enjoyed um, the breakout session for computer science, and um, I really I thought Dr. Sios, who was the I believe still is the head of the department, um, he I just really uh, had an affinity towards him. I thought he was really cool. He seemed to really care about things. He was like a very much a straight shooter. Um, one thing that he said was that like there's a big um, focus on undergraduate here at BCU. And that really stuck with me because I, I know that at other universities, um, it's only, people only really care about like the research of graduate students and that sort of <coughs> thing. And I didn't want to be lost among the crowds. Um, also, David Jackson was like demoing one of, <laughs> one of the things he had built. And that was really cool. Like he let us come up and like, uh, mess with it and stuff and I was like oh this is like really cool and it, it was just a really great environment and um, I had gone up to Dr. Seos at the end like I was really bold looking back <laughs> and I had said to him like you know I really uh, the school VCU has sent me like a scholarship and I you know I want VCU to be like more like um, I want to like if there's any other scholarships I can apply for where you let me know because um, I want, you know, to maximize like that opportunity for myself. And he was like, cool, like, um, we give your email, I'll let you know. And I was like, great, thank you. And then like within a couple weeks, I actually got another letter from VCU from the School of Engineering for a computer science scholarship. And I was like, whoa, like, it seemed like it was really an environment of like, if you ask and if you really want something, like they're gonna help you get that. And they're going to help you like achieve whatever you want to do. And so I really liked that. It really made me feel like there was a personal touch there, and it felt like I already I hadn't even started there, but like I was being heard, and that really meant a lot to me. And so that's really what why I chose VCU. Yeah, I feel like I had a pretty like uh, similar experience. I mean, like like I said earlier, like with working with like David and Dr. Seos too. Like their focus really was on like undergrad and being like there for students and it was, that was definitely the most I like took out of the seat was just that there were so much resources if you ask for it if you work hard you get it and it, that was just like an awesome experience as far as like choosing VCU, I was essentially like a huge slacker in high school I, was, <laughs> I lived I went to Hannah High School which is like 15 minutes up the street and I was like well, I don't know what school to go to I'll just apply to VCU. and I remember it's so funny I drove downtown and I handed in my application to the admissions office, and then I come back to my car, parking ticket. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, right so yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, all right, I'm welcome. <laughs> yeah, right. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to hear about, I mean, you can start. Uh, I want to hear a little bit about what are some of the biggest challenges facing each of your industries. So in, in your role at Google, what are some of the things that you think are, are some of the biggest issues or challenges that, that you personally are facing or the organization or technology in general are facing? Yeah, yeah. Um, probably organizationally, like, uh, I feel like there's a, a big rush to find an applications for AI. Like, it's, it's definitely, like, the cool thing. Everyone who comes in wants to do it, and everyone in school is super excited about it, and, and it, like, everyone wants to contribute there. Um, and a lot of people will study AI, like machine learning, on their in their free time and try to transfer into a position like that. Um, but getting it to produce like good results, like better than just like a like, like a normal heuristic, is is really really difficult. Um, like it's actually it, it just knowing how hard it is to apply AI just makes like self driving cars seem like that even more like crazy. That that it, 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 it which is an extremely dynamic problem. There's so much that can happen. Like someone can run on the street or whatever, like blah, blah blah, and you know that's solving that. But so finding applications for AI, like I think that's 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 really hard. Um, one of the biggest challenges. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to hear your perspective <laughs> yeah, in your 25-hour day. What are some of your biggest challenges? 
Um, I don't think, I think as an industry as a whole, one of the biggest challenges we're seeing, I mean, two, we were just talking about one, it's like culture, startups. Um, you see all these big companies like blow up and they're, you know, like how the hell are they killing this hard? Because they build it with five or 10 people and they're, they're like hustlers, right? And they build, they don't, you don't realize it as your company starts growing so fast, you don't realize you're hiring people and you're not thinking about like one inclusion and just other things like cultural aspects that you just don't think about as your company's growing so fast honestly because you're just like i need an ios engineer i need like this guy i need a devops i need a, you just you're just hiring talent and you're just scaling this company so fast um you don't really think about a lot of those things so we're seeing a lot of like cultural challenges um, and that's something we were just talking about before this um and then i think the second thing is like bubbles right you see a lot of people out here raising it's like a lot of money. Um, a lot, man. Like, uh, like a lot of money here. Yeah, sorry. There is like a lot of money, and you're like, what are you doing again? And it's just, it's creating these bubbles. I think one of the biggest things we see right now is the scooter bubble. If you live oh, out here, goodness. scooters. Right it, they got in the trim too. Yeah, I mean, they're everywhere, but I mean, as you think about it, you're kind of like, it's a nice to have, but like, is it, is it like solving a problem, right? Are we getting back to the basics, or did they just raise $100 million for like, you know, what? Um, so that, those are the two things I see is like fundraising bubbles like, that are killing just fundraising in general and, and markets. And then I also just see the cultural thing when you're building a startup, it's challenging. So you're, you're long pizza robots. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's a pizza robot company they that actually raised, raised $200 million yeah. to deliver pizzas. Yeah. Which I think it's pretty interesting. They raised a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. I never thought about that. So <laughs> the bubbles in like the startup space, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I echo what um, Vern said about like uh, the culture and I think in, internally to our industry, you know, diversity is a big thing. I still, Apple does a really great job of this, I will say. Like I am really happy to, on a daily basis, work with other engineers who are women, senior engineers who are women, like junior engineers who are women, and that is really great. Um, as well as, you know, not just women, like people of color um, as well. Um, but still, like when I go into a meeting and everything, that's kind of it on, it's something that I don't, it's not really something I try to think about, but in the back of my mind, I'm, you know, you go into a room for a meeting and you're kind of counting like, okay, how many women are, are represented here? How many people of color are represented here? Um, and as well, that's also something I think about when I look at um, events we have, whether they're internal, like all hands meetings with our executive board or, you know, like WWDC every year, I'm, I'm looking at and unconsciously, like I'm, I mean, consciously, but like without trying to, I'm, you know, looking, do we have women presenting on stage? Like, do we have people of color presenting on stage? Um, because that visibility is really important and it's important for like young people to, to see that so that they can see themselves in this industry so that they know it's like possible. Because like I said, I didn't have computer science on my radar until one person suggested it to me off a whim. So, um, Internally, I think that's a big challenge. Um, externally, when we talk about consumers of technology, I think a big thing we have to think about is privacy um, of data. And, um, you know, I luckily I work for a company that I think shares that concern. Apple is like the first to say, you know, our product is our device, is our computers, our phones, our tap, like our iPads, not, um, not our users. Not, we're not selling our users. We're not selling your ad profile, that sort of stuff. Um, whereas like, a lot of companies in our space that's like they have um that's like how they make money and so you know it, we got to stick to our guns about that and stick to our morals and our values so you know it doesn't matter like how much money is on the table when that's involved like we want people to feel safe using our products and um it's not just a problem for the tech company but also like the consumer to make to make them like a little aware about like look like um Maybe at first glance you don't think it's important, but we just want you to be um, really the owner of your data and be in charge and feel like you're not like helpless when it comes to your data and your persona online. Um, so yeah, that's amazing. Awesome. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about asked earlier. You know, the entertainment industry and the way it builds up working at Apple, Google, and a startup. What are what are some common misconceptions people have had about you or? asked you or said to you and uh, how can we combat some of these misconceptions and communicate what you guys do more effectively? You guys get it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, misconceptions, it's like, I don't know, I, I, I feel like I've come across too many. I, I, actually, I, I, there are a few, right? It's, uh, I think a lot of people, especially with being, uh, 
not Apple, a company that relies on user data to kind of operate. It, a lot of people externally think that we're just trying to get everything we can, sell it or whatever, and, and do some really, I don't know, messed up stuff uh, on the user. And, uh, and it, unfortunately, things like that happen. I mean, you see in the news, like with uh, Facebook a lot. Um, but like, I don't think anyone's like actively trying to, you know, get data just because they can. It's like a lot of times there's so many like steps and checks and barriers. It's like if I want to implement any feature that collects user data, I have to store it in a very specific location. I have to state exactly what I'm going to store. It has to be reviewed by like a bunch of councils, which this is like the big company part that kind of, but, it, but it's there for user safety. And uh, like there's just, there's so many protections for the user. Um, just to avoid these like these situations that kind of feed into this misconception that like we're just collecting it to have it. Um, how do we combat it? You know, it's like uh, you ever scroll through your Facebook feed and it's like, oh, here's your data. Check up on your like security or account security and all this stuff, and see what apps are you know asking for your data and stuff. I think more things like that help, um, but I, I don't know. It's, it's a hard fight. Yeah. I would say, and Alan, this might, uh, you might resonate with this too. One big misconception is like, what do I do slash am I IT in the sense where it's like you go home for the holidays and you become your family's like personal <laughs> IT, right? It's like, oh, I, I have this iPad, like this stopped working. Can you fix my phone? Can you do this? Can you do this? I'm like, oh my gosh, like I can help you fix your stuff as much as anyone who owns a phone can. Like, I'm going to tell you, like, did you turn it off and turn it back on again? Like, that sort of stuff. But, like, I don't, um, I don't know how to fix phones, really. Like, I, I'm writing an operating system that goes on the phone. So, like, you know, I, I, can't, I can't really fix your phone for you. I'm sorry. Like, please go to an Apple, Apple store. Like, I, of course, I'll look at it, you know. But um, that's, I think, a huge misconception. Um, you know, I'm not like IT help type stuff, um, and which is fine. Like, I don't really know how to combat that. I'm not sure. More tech literacy. Yeah, more tech literacy, maybe. Like, because it's just like, oh, she works in tech, and I might, you know, I might as well be like a genius at yeah. Best Buy. Like, it doesn't, you know, it's, there's no real difference to people, which is fine. Um, but um, just that's just something that always kind of amuses me. And then I have you know, friends and family, oh, like I'm looking at, you know, how much does this cost? Like, is it better to do like the plan with Sprint, this and that? And I'm like, oh gosh, like, I don't know. Like, I don't do the business side of it either. So it's like, I don't, I don't, I have to look up how much our products cost. Like, I don't know. People ask me when the next thing is coming out. That one, mis one big misconception about me that because I work at Apple is that I know everything about Apple products. And I'll be the first to tell you, I don't. I'm just as in the dark as you are. Like, um, I can't tell you when the next XYZ is coming out because I don't know. Like, I don't. So, um, so yeah, those are two big ones I deal with. And just um, part of it, you know, I can help combat it with like my own transparency and also just like tech literacy for people. Yeah. Like the difference between like someone who can fix things it's I what I've started telling people it's like you wouldn't call up a like an architect to um fix your toilet like fix your like unplug your toilet versus like someone who knows like how to uh, how to stop a blockage how to unblock something versus someone who like built built the building right <laughs> that was a good one thank you I don't, I don't know how I can follow that <laughs> for me misconceptions I don't know any missing. I think not here so much, but when I go back to the East Coast, it's funny to meet people and they're like, "Oh, you're a CEO, of like a tech company." Like it's like you think like we're going to baller parties and like, we're funny. at Burning Man, and, like, like I'm sorry, where's the Tesla like, <laughs> tents and like Teslas and like all this stuff? And I'm just like, no, dude, like we're working 24 hours a day. I think that's like a huge misconception. Also, when you raise money, everyone's instantly like, "Oh, you're rich." And I'm like, no, this is not any of my money. Actually, this is like literally investment, right? So that's funny. It's it's super funny explaining to like older people, like my grandmother. She's oh, yeah. like, "So what's going on? So what are you doing? And how much money? Do you have to pay that money back? Like what's going on?" So it's like those are the, I guess like the, the lower level misconceptions that I have. Um, there's no way to really combat it besides like educating more people in the industry of startups. I mean, everyone here, 
they're so used to startups, so they're just like, oh, you're, you're eating ramen. It's like a it's like a thing, right? But movies like Social Network and <laughs> founders <laughs> like Valley. yeah, Silicon Valley and like founders like Evan Spiegel and Bobby from Snapchat. Those guys, I mean, you see that kind of larger than lifestyle, like larger than life lifestyle. You're like, oh, every CEO is like that. I mean, some CEOs are like that. Like their CEOs, they were and they are like that, right? So. Um, I think it's a process, and a lot of people look at the end result of everything. They don't look at the process, right? It's, it's a process. Jeff, yeah. we have a question from Instagram. Ooh. Oh. Um, so Prim and Proper on Instagram has a question for Melissa. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> what advice might you give for women who might want to enter the tech industry? Yeah. So great question. Um, my advice would be number one. Um, so I don't know the person asking the question where they are, if they're a student, if they're already in their career. They're proven proper though. Yeah, but they are proven proper, right. so that's the points. Um, but um, I would say, first of all, you have to be, uh, have to have perseverance. You have to, that was something I learned in school, in school, like in college. For me, like school was always something that came easy for me. When I started programming, my first thought was like, oh, I'm not good at this and I need to quit, and I need to drop out of school because I can't do this, and it was, a, it was a new thing for me. And that was really how I learned how to persevere, was like learning how to program and becoming good at that and learning with frustration. Um, so push through, like, that's my first point of advice. My second point of advice would be to get a mentor, or like someone you trust, someone who believes in you and has your back, and I've been really fortunate, like, they said in my bio to have like my the internship I had when I was in college I met um, some really great mentors who um, the way I describe it is they I had a voice but they like gave me a microphone and that is really what helped me they didn't try to speak for me they didn't try to speak over me but they were the ones saying like Melissa can do it Melissa can do this like she can and I really needed that at the beginning of my career because I had no confidence <laughs> I was like I was afraid to talk to people in my classes because like I didn't like I was afraid people would think I was stupid and that sort of thing um, so having mentors that I trusted and that really believed in me was the best thing I did for myself and that's what I would say to people um, you know women starting out especially and you know minorities and anyone who feels like the pressure is on like um, twofold kind of so um, yeah that's my advice thanks for the question <laughs> I have just a couple left, so this would be good. If anybody has one in the audience, feel free to shout it out. Uh, cool. So, how often have you guys been back to Richmond? What do you What do you like about changes? Dislike? You know, when was the last time you were back? Uh, yeah, when was the last time you were back? <laughs> I just talked. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I go back pretty often. Cool. Um, I have lots of family and friends in Richmond. I probably go back like every six weeks. Uh, I think oh. I. I think I was there over winter break, uh, the middle of break. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Richmond's actually like, it's crazy how much construction is going on. Like, I feel like my freshman year, it was so cool. I was sitting up in Brown, like the 14th floor, and they're like building raisin canes, like right outside my window. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, cool, construction. And they're building like uh, West Grace, North and South and stuff, but now they've like, Park, they build up the Contemporary Art Center, they have a 10x the size of GRC, like I think another engineering building is coming, like yeah, okay, so there's there's just so much growth going on, um, which is crazy, it's, just, it's the amount that it seems is growing, it's, it's cool, it's awesome. Cool. Yeah, I went back to Richmond for the holidays for Christmas. Um, my dad actually lives right across the street from Bride and Belvedere, so oh, nice. I'm like, I see everything that's going on. Uh, Richmond's building up nicely. Um, I'm actually going back to Richmond again to speak on another panel for my fraternity, so I'm in Kappa Alpha Psi uh, in April, so yeah, I'll be back in Richmond in April. Um, I was just there also, so I'm also from the Richmond area. I grew up in like Southside, Lothian, Chesterfield area. Um, and so I, that's where like kind of home base is for me with family. Um, so I go back for holidays. Um, I was just there in December, um, for break and stuff. And then I'm not sure the next time that I will be back, 
Um, I need to figure that out. So far. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, so, far. it's, it's so far. It's, it's like, so far. It's, you know, it's, it's just like a big endeavor just for a weekend. You wish you could just go for a weekend, but it, you know, it's like most of the time is spent flying if you're only there for like a weekend. But um, so I love going back and visiting VCU. I was there with a couple friends, like when I was home for Christmas and stuff, and I felt a lot of nostalgia for it, which is like, I don't feel nostalgic for a lot of things, so that was kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> no, VCU was great. They built it up. They, um, it was cool seeing the ICA, the Contemporary Art Place, um, open. I still need to go to it. Um, I hope, I like that it's um, continuing to grow, but I hope that it still, you know, maintains the charm of like Richmond. It's funny because, you know, when I was going there, my parents are also Richmond. And so when I would say like, oh yeah, I'm going to a friend's house and I live in this neighborhood, they were like, oh my gosh, like you can't like go over there, it's a terrible <laughs> part. And I'm like, well, no, it's like all VCU now, so it's not really. Um, so it's interesting, like with that transformation of what, you know, what our parents who are born and raised in Richmond think of Richmond versus like what it is now. I go back every time I go back and see a VCU basketball game at the Siegel Center, uh, just because I love VCU basketball. Um, and yeah, so you know it's hard. It's hard for a school that's in an urban setting because you gotta, you want to expand, you want to continue to build up your name, but you don't want to be like a gentrifying, like just mob. And so it's you gotta walk that line of um, keeping, you know, the community intact, not just not, not like forcing people out, but also like have strategic growth. So I know it's it's a hard job for VCU to do. So and I commend them for you know doing that and walking that line. So you answered this a little bit with the online question, but I'd love to hear like, one piece of practical, practical advice you would give somebody who wants to walk in the shoes you're walking on, walking in. The advice I would give is to uh, kind of follow, follow this guy and, <laughs> and hustle. You have to hustle, you have to work hard, because like, if you just kind of you know shuffle through, uh, you can go far, but if you really work for it, you can go even further. You can, you can do things you never thought were possible, and and I feel like in tech, like you you have to you have to hustle really hard. You have to you have to learn the skills. You've got to do what you want. You got to step outside your comfort zone. You got to speak to people who are worth a million times more than you. <laughs> like you have to do all kinds of crazy things and, and, and be open to doing it all. And yeah, uh, that's my best advice. Right. Um, Mine is, I, I guess, don't be afraid to ask for something. Um, so like, I'm, a, I'm like, everyone, every CEO is probably like a Steve Jobs stan, I am as well, right? But um, I remember he did this interview and he was just like, you know, he needed something when he was first building Apple. He literally called up like David Packer from Hewlett Packer and was like, yo, I need this. And he never received a call from anyone asking for anything. So he literally just sent it over to him, right? And I noticed, especially when I first got here, a lot of people were afraid you know, we're walking around the office and like, oh yeah, Gary's walking out there like, he's there, but I'm not gonna like, and I'm like, no, dude, I need to talk to someone at Uber. Like, I need to do this, I need to do that. And so many people don't ask someone something because they're afraid like they're a billionaire, or they're, they're like, they're humans, right? So if you wanna get ahead, you're gonna have to communicate with these types of people. And especially if you see yourself aspiring to that level, you're gonna have to learn how to communicate and interact with those type of people. So um, I, I would just say, don't be afraid to ask for things because all they can say is no. Just the back where you started off from, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great advice. And also, that was advice that was given to me for the first time in my life when I was at VCU from Laura Lemza, who works in the Career Center at the School of Engineering. Shout out to her. She was amazing. She's I would amazing. I would just, like, pop in her office and be like, hey, like, <laughs> I know, like, you aren't expecting me, but I need your help. <laughs> like, and it was just, like, for, like, the re weirdest things that I could have, whatever. But it was, she was always there for me, so I really appreciate that. And one thing... I had to, I was emailing actually the Dean of the School of Engineering for something, and she, I asked her to reread my email for me before I sent it, and she read my whole email, and she was like, you'd never asked for what you wanted. Like, it's all this flowery language, you're like dancing around the topic, like, you need to just come out and say it. And I was like, oh, that's like a really good point. Like, I probably should. And I learned that lesson there, and that's something that I've really taken with me, where it's like, you can't just like expect, you know, something to be given to you. There's a saying like, closed mouths don't get fed, that sort of thing, where it's like you have to ask or no one will know what you want. And then as far as practical advice goes, um, get an internship. Like so many people contact me like cold email, like I want to study computer science. Like 
what should I do? Or like, what field should I go into? And I get it that technology is wide breadth, like this slot, like just so many things. You should get an internship, get a couple, figure out what you like, figure out what you don't like, because that's just as important, and then go from there. Um, you know, you don't have to start at Apple at the beginning. Like I didn't, I had other jobs and stuff before, and it was really helpful for me to figure out what I liked and what I didn't like, and um, yeah. We have another question from Instagram. Yeah. Um, this is from Taylor Lamb. So she asks, uh, what is a book that you would gift to someone or recommend? Depends on what part of your life you're at. If you're trying to get a job at like Apple or Google or something, I'd give them like cracking a coding mm -hmm. interview. That's like the, it literally says on the cover how to get a job at <laughs> Amazon or whatever. Um, but once, if they're already in their career, I would give them uh, this book called Critical or Crucial Conversations, and it's it's an amazing book. It talks about how to um, like how how do you kind of really have a conversation when it's a sensitive topic, when it's really hard to get what you like, get what you want or say what you mean. Um, I've read I've read a good portion of it, kind of skimmed through it, the audiobook and such, but it's it was, I learned so much just from the little bit I have read. Um. So I think that was good advice. That's a really good book too. Um, and then probably two books I'd give. One is Pitch Anything. Um, it's a book about this guy who's like teaching you how to sell. I think selling is one of the biggest benefits and like it's like a it's like a tool in your toolbox no matter if you're working at a startup or at a bigger company. You're always trying to convince someone of something, whether you're a manager or you're a CEO or you're an employee trying to talk to your boss and saying, we need to do this, we should add this to our roadmap. Um, you're always trying to convince someone, so I think that's like a huge skill that a lot of people just step over. Um, and then the second one is the uh, hard thing about hard things. Probably, I don't know if you guys have heard that, but I think Ben Horowitz is super smart, and I think the book's dope because he uses rap <laughs> songs to like label the titles. I think that's super clever. And it basically talks about the ups and downs of running a company. And I mean, throughout the book, you just see this incredible hustle. I mean, you look at him now, and you're like, wow, he's killing it. But I mean, he went through so much stuff. I mean, literally, like running out of the month, like running out of money, and he raises like a couple million dollars in like a day, right? And you're like, how? Oh, you know, it's just like extreme perseverance. It's, it's great. It's a great book. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd recommend um, what Alan said. Of along with um, there is uh, one book that a lot of places recommend their engineers read called The Pragmatic Programmer. Um, which is pretty good. And then another one called Clean Code, which I forget the author of that now, um, which is just about like, you know, the odds and ends of writing good code. Um, but that's like, those are very specific to what I do. So I don't know, I, I need to, it sounds like fresh up on my reading. <laughs> I feel bad, I, yeah. Well, we have another question. Cool. This one's from Facebook. Um, so this is for Vern. Um, <coughs> Can we hear more about Vern Startup? Uh, what is it all about? Um, so, so essentially, pitch I, it. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to pitch you guys at all. I'm so tired of pitching. Guys. <laughs> um, as as you guys know, I went to VCU. Um, there was a couple of companies that I wanted to actually talk to when I went to VCU, and unfortunately, those companies didn't come to our career fair. And that's no knock to VCU. That's just a lot of companies don't have the budget to come to every school, right? They got to go to their top tier schools, which they call their target universities. Um, I worked at Capital One, helped do some recruiting, and I noticed right off the bat we were only going to the same universities every year. And I was like, well, dude, how are we going to hit these diversity inclusion goals and like bring more students into the pipeline if we're going to do the same thing every year? Um, they were like, Brian, we don't have the budget to talk to every school. So I was like, I'm going to build something so that every company, regardless of the size of their brand, can press a button and launch a live event, much like we're doing now, and students can ask questions to great people like this who work at Google, Amazon, Facebook, and say, how can I get a job there? What did you do? What do you look for on a resume? And they can actually talk to direct recruiters, even if they don't come to VCU. Um, and I just noticed this was like something I used. I actually was gonna work at Snapchat before I started my company. Um, and I literally reached out to a recruiter, asked him like, what does he look for on a resume? And he told me and I got an interview and I went to Venice Beach and interviewed at Snapchat. And I was like, I'm gonna build this because if I can build this, if I can do this, I can build this so everyone has access to the information. And it seems to me that information access is the, is the key to diversity inclusion and solving a lot of the hiring goals. Because if 
you don't know what skills are needed to get a job at Google or get a job at Apple, and you don't know anyone who works at Apple or works at Google, how are you gonna get a job at Apple or Google, right? You have no way. Um, so we literally did one thing really well. The app is literally only a company, like Apple can host a live Q&A, and students from anywhere in the US can join and ask questions for an hour. After that hour, the recruiter gets every piece of data and data sets and it's protected data, but we share it with the recruiters and they can actually reach out to students and cherry pick students that they really want to engage. So if they hire, hire one student from VCU at Apple, when it's time to recruit again, she's an alumni, so she's gonna be more willing to look at another student from VCU, which helps more VCU students get hired at Apple. Same with Howard University and other schools. What's the site? Uh, so it's hollowthere.com. We're launching a new product in this Sunday, so if all goes well. This development is, these guys know it's like crazy, so. Um, but yeah, we're super excited. We posted over 30, 70 events, Pinterest, Slack, Facebook, not Google yet, not Apple yet, uh, Capital One, some pretty big companies, so uh, yeah, we're super excited. That's cool. Yeah. You talked about fundraising. What fundraising level are you at right now? Um, so we raised, all, um, just now we raised uh, 750000 so uh, Garrett Camp and those guys at Expo put in uh, 625000 and then we had another investor. Uh, he built most of the network solutions in Tyson's Corner, um, which were bought by Amazon, which as you guys know, Tyson, uh, Jeff is, and some of those guys are moving to uh, Tyson's Corner, put in some money as well. Um, we're gonna go back, uh, usually raise on milestones. Um, so we have a product launch, we're signing like uh, three big, bigger contracts with companies, um, and then we just hired like a key killer player on our team. I wanna tell you guys, but she's so good. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're gonna go start raising again in March. Cool. So yeah, probably probably a pretty big round. I'm thinking like seven, seven to ten. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions for us? Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, everybody. This has been really cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.